So Bill McMillan and Dr. Pat Trotter and I, um, following up on a earlier related project that we did for the Wild Salmon Center on the Ho, um, um, estimated, gathered data to estimate the historical abundance of Puget Sound steelhead based primarily on commercial steelhead catch in the late 18, 1890s. Um, commercial catch started with, um, for steelhead with statehood in 1889, and it rapidly built up. Uh, there was um, historic, there was harvest before then, before statehood. The record is not as detailed as it was upon statehood, and that's when the fishery really ramped up. And in 1895, the largest catch occurred, and then for the next 20 years, catches occurred in, in pretty much declined. So we followed, um, we focused on that 1895 data, and all I did was the statistical analysis and estimation of the historical abundance. The real road work was done with, by Bill McMillan and Pat Trotter. I'll go into some of the gathering the data. But what we wanted to get was a reasonable historical baseline to give, give an idea of what we have lost and in a way how we've lost it and hopefully that that will help inform our understanding of what the potential really might be for a recovered Puget Sound steelhead um, DPS, distinct population segment in uh, ESU. We published this paper um, in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences in 2011. Um, I was the lead author on it um, and Bill and Pat were co-authors. Uh, I think we can, many of you are familiar with the paper. I, I'll try to provide a copy to the coalition so that others can get it directly. Um, so again, our, our purpose there was to estimate the abundance of Puget Sound steelhead based first upon the commercial catch data for the peak year of catch of 1895 and historical data regarding regional development to estimate unreported steelhead catch. Um, and Bill and Pat, and particularly Bill, gathered extensive historical data um, to convince us that it was considerable, what we called the off-the-books catch. <clears throat> so and we wanted to provide a robust historical baseline using that. Um, so there were the commercial catch data that was available <clears throat> for this period, say 1895, was commercial catch data landed attributable to the Nooksack, this is Bellingham Bay and, and the lower main stem Nooksack, the Skagit, <clears throat> the Stilaguamish, the Snohomish, and then the remaining aggregates of rivers were reported as, as lumped together. So really we had, we called them five populations, but five groups. You know what Puget Sound looks like, here's our, the Skagit um, up here in the Stilly. Snohomish. So our, most of this data came from the northern part, north central part of Puget Sound. All the other rivers combined then were. And it, you know, our definition of Puget Sound followed the historical catch data, which was east of the Macaw Reservation. So a little bit more of the strait than the current um, Puget Sound DPS, which is the Elwha East. Here's the commercial catch data for 1895 in pounds of steelhead, and this was winter run steelhead, 660,000 pounds in the Nooksack, 205 in the Skagit, 180,000 in the Stillaguamish, 400,000 pounds of steelhead in the Snohomish, and in the remaining basins, which would have included the Puyallup, Nisqually, probably the Elwha, um, Green, Black, uh, and so forth, 518 plus. So nearly two million pound, pounds of winter steelhead landed in 1895. <clears throat> so we started with that data. We needed to then estimate the average weight of fish. We looked extensively at historical data for fish weight <clears throat> um, going back from as early as 1850, again, thanks to Bill and, the, and through the 1930s. And um, then we also estimated the unreported catch as a fraction in pounds of the commercially reported catch. 
And from that, our objective was to get total numbers caught for each of those five units. And then to estimate based on that and historical information about the fishery and so forth, to estimate a harvest rate that that catch represented. And then from that, can estimate the total run size. So we used the Bayesian analysis to bracket all the uncertainty. We estimated that the range of weight was between seven and nine pounds. That is the average weight of the catch. By the way, the, the biological review team for NOAA Fisheries, George Pass, Tim, uh, Tim Beachy, Jim Myers, Jeff Hart, and others, um, had also in the BRT report used this same data, the commercial catch data, they estimated a slightly larger average size. Um, we worked with them, we discussed with them and their habitat people quite a bit as part of the preparatory work building up to this. Uh, they cited our estimate in the, the uh, viability analysis that came out in 2013 for Puget Sound Steelhead. Um, so we used, this is the average weight. We thought this was <clears throat> the range of average steelhead weight across all those rivers. We assume that the nook sack, because of given its large catch, the heavy early industrialization in Bellingham, relatively speaking, agricultural and land development was relatively smaller than it was in the other basins. So we estimated that the off the books catch, which was mainly agricultural use, subsistence use, use for fertilizer, was 10 to 30% of the commercial catch. In the other basins, and I, we, we, we investigated this and talked about it among ourselves extensively, and it never got challenged in peer review. We, we estimated the minimum unreported catch for each of these basins was 50%, at least, of the com reported commercial catch. Um, and Bill can speak to the details of that, but I'll just, that's where, where we got that. So we basically are going to produce a statistical probability distribution of the catch and the run size. They look like this. Here's the distribution of the total catch we estimated for the Snohomish Basin. So the most likely number, if you were to pick one, would be up there around 85,000. But given the uncertainty and all the parameters we have to estimate, it might be as low as you know, 65 or so, and as high as nearly 120 individual winter steelhead caught. <clears throat> so we then estimate the terminal run from that. <clears throat> we estimated that the harvest rate on the Nooksack had to have been very high that year, at least 60%. <clears throat> on the Skagit, which was less developed <clears throat> both for agriculture, was transportation wise, kind of in a no man, almost a no man's land between Bellingham and Everett, Seattle. Um, that its harvest rate was probably lower, but no small, no lower than 30%. Um, <clears throat> bear in mind that the higher the harvest rate we estimate, the lower the run size we're going to estimate, because a higher fraction of the total run is already there in the commercial catch and the unlanded catch. So the others, we estimated for the Stilly, Snohomish, and the remaining aggregate, a minimum harvest rate on that run of 40%. <clears throat> Could be as high as 70%. And then, so we, then you get a distribution for the terminal run size here for the Snohomish, uh, a little over, the, the most likely estimate would be around 170, 180,000, but might be as high as over two, 260,000. Could be as small as 100,000. And we did this similarly for the others. <clears throat> so here's a summary of the results. Because you have that skewed distribution, the average distribution, the mean, will be a little pulled up from what the peak of the distribution is. So if you look at the mode as the most likely, if you were to pick a single number, it's the mode, the Nooksack, <clears throat> the Catch, 91,000, the Skagit, 43,000, the Stilly, nearly 38,000, the Snohomish, nearly 84, the remaining 109. And if we then look at the total run in for the Nooksack, that run was close to 128,000 steelhead. 
The Skagit, which is probably underestimated because of the data, um, the catch data that we have and the, the catch, it's possible the harvest rate was lower than 30%, in which case the run would be higher. But given, given all the, bra the bracketing, our estimate was the Skagit it did come in lower, 80, about 87,000. Run size, 69 plus for the steely, 153,000. But again, here are the, here's the center of the 90% of that distribution. So if you were to go back to that and, oops, go back to that. You go back to that and pick what's the, what's the central 90% of that whole curve. That's what these are. And if, so if you look at the aggregate for all of Puget Sound, the lowest five percentile, well, so between the five percentile and the 95th, 485,000, that is, there's a 95% probability that it was at least 485,000. Five percent probable or less that it might have been smaller. There's a five percent probability that it was greater than 930,000 but a 95% probability that it was less, equal to or less than 930,000 Puget Sound wide. So we then wanted to compare this in a number of ways that we hoped were informative to current and recent conditions, and we basically used two comparisons. <clears throat> the estimate of the turn of the century, uh, we compare this to the status review estimate, which at the time of our publication was the 205, 2005 NOAA report. Good was the, Tom Good was the lead author on that. Um, so the average for the previous 25 years, 1980 to 2004, and then the recent five years. And then we also compared the, <clears throat> we scaled the estimates to the estimated length of stream accessible to adults. Not spawning habitat, because we don't have that. Not rearing habitat, we don't have that. We, we're getting better now, and I'm working with George Pass and Tim Beachy at NOAA now and others to, um, to gather and apply some of that data both to the historical and the current <clears throat> condition. But, so what we had were pretty good estimates both from the state steelhead management plan and from no work NOAA Fisheries was doing as to both current and circa 1895 lengths of stream accessible to winter, adult winter steelhead. If they wanted to get there, they could swim there. So it didn't count barriers that only summer runs could jump up to. Didn't mean they could necessarily spawn there, it's just a way to scale these numbers to fish per accessible stream mile, stream kilometer. <clears throat> so under current conditions, in there, the Nooksack had very little data. We just picked the, the number we have for 2003, applied it for both years. These are the numbers for um, the Skagit. Um, the average for the 25 year average for the Skagit that in 2005 was not quite 7,000. Um, the more recent five year average was 5,400. So on and so so the all of Puget Sound at that time, the 25-year average was 21, 678, almost 22. The five-year average was under 16,000. That number is essentially what the last year's recovery outline by NOAA um, estimated for listed for Puget Sound. So then we looked at historical um, this is the current stream, accessible stream kilometers under current conditions. Nooksack 612 kilometers, Skagit 982, Snohomish 926, that counts, all we saw the forks and Pilchuck and yada yada. The same for the Stillaguamish 445. So you just take the average abundance, divide it by that, and you get fish per stream kilometer, returning runs, adults per stream kilometer for 25 years, for the most recent five years. The basin-wide average, the DPS-wide average, rather, 3.1 for the 20 adults per linear stream kilometer, 2.2 for the most recent 2000 to 2004 
pretty close to what's current today. The historical estimates, we essentially took the conser conservative route, no fisheries estimated that one third of the accessible stream habitat, Puget Sound wide, essentially, that was available and accessible in 1895 was lost. So we got two thirds of what was left. So we call this stream kilometers historical. Um, the Nooksack didn't change much from today, 1,400, 668,000 for the Stilly. And then we take our the mode, that most likely single value of the run, and divide it by that. And we get at the mode 139. If you take the fifth percentile, or there's a 95% of that, those run distributions are greater than the fifth percentile. The Nooksack in 1895 returned 110 adults per stream kilometer. The Skagit 48, the Snohomish 82, Stilly 77, the rest of Puget Sound overall 25. The average 47 adult steelhead per stream kilometer historically accessible in 1895. Here's just a bar graph of the same data. We did one other thing that, so these are the historical mode, historical fifth percentile, lower fifth percent, 25 year average, five year average, recent. We did one other thing. We wanted to know historically, you know, how might that compare? Well, we happened to, Bill had happened to spend some time on the Seatuck River out of Yakutat. Um, one or more years prior, just prior to um, this. And he contacted, other than having some interesting steelhead fishing, he had made the acquaintance of, uh, I think, Brian Marsden, who's the Alaska ADF and G biologist in charge of that area, and someone who's very interested in historical information. And he provided us with an estimate of the recovered sea tuck steelhead after they tried to wipe steelhead out in the 30s. Um, from weir counts in 1952. And so the sea tuck, which is admittedly a tundra-like low gradient with a lake headwater basin, a bit on the face of it, a bit different from Puget Sound rivers, was a, the, the length of accessible habitats, 100 kilometers. So the sea tuck in 1952 actually came back at having returned nearly 30,000 steelhead winter runs. Came back between 250 and 300 adult steelhead per accessible stream kilometer as a returning run. So we think those numbers don't look all that huge or um, stunning. <laughs> I mean, they're stunning, <laughs> but they're not off the, we don't think they're, that, that they are off the charts. And of course, you know, one of the things we'd like, we'd like to do, still are going to be doing, is then try to scale that to, you know, a, amount of spawning habitat, density of spawners, reds per stream kilometer. So that work, that work is to be done, but it really doesn't affect the basic message here. So basic, you know, conclusions are current abundance is one to four percent of what we estimated at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. Habitat currently accessible to winter adult steelhead is no less than 67%. I think the state steelhead management plan actually, Scott and Gill actually has them like 22% um, lost rather than 33% lost. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's unlikely, we think, arguably, that habitat loss alone can explain the majority of the historic decline. So this may indicate that significant recovery is still in the cards. Obviously, all of you here that are familiar with steelhead, whether you're professional biologists or amateur biologists or not, can probably come up with a number of possible hypotheses and reasons for why the habitat that's available isn't as productive or returning as many steelhead. That's part of this great opportunity that we've created, helped create on the Skagit for the next 12 years that'll be partly the subject of my talk, my talk after Bill, second talk, which will be about the lawsuit um, and what we settled, how, how and why we settled for what we did. Um, so certainly impairment of both the ecosystem and the function of the odd ecological, the function of 
the, the critter itself. Um, productivity of the habitat, quality for sure of the physical habitat, not just its quantity. We got some, we, we got quantity. That's a pretty good start. That's some good news. Um, loss of life history and genetic diversity, repeat number of repeat spawners, range of river entry timing, particularly early wild. Um, other diversity, in addition to that, which I, I'm sure John will um, give us some insights and substance on. And interactions with hatchery fish, which, which uh, I will talk on a little bit um, in the third, my next talk, and uh, will be a subject of discussion here in part, I think, throughout the afternoon. But the main, the, the main take home message is the abundance that we had not that long ago, but certainly pre a great deal of development that has happened since then, was pretty stunning. Um, we still have a great deal of the physical accessible habitat quantity still available. So recovery potential, um, our work's cut out for us, but um, prospects in terms of the potential is not as grim as we perhaps might think. So thank you. <laughs>